Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the track after lunch. Uh, we are going to start right away because time is running. So uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for attending again. Uh, we are going to have this first talk this afternoon with uh, Mark Smith, who is a professor of paleography in Paris. Thank you, Mark. All right, thank you, Laura, for the, the introduction. Um, thank you to everyone for, here, for being here rather than learning how to better price your fonts. Um, and I'm, I'm delighted to be here among many friends and many other people whose names are famous and I've read about and seen their work but have never had an opportunity to meet them in person. So the fact that this whole conference is happening in person is uh, a great pleasure, I think, to all of us. So I'll be uh, talking today about some of the aspects of the uh, development of Latin, Roman letter forms over time, um, looking at how they have constantly been adapting to functional and especially technical and material change over time. In, in um, ancient times, uh, writing went through multiple changes in functional and technical material settings, uh, which are mostly left outside the general narrative by paleographers or calligraphers when they describe the history of the Roman alphabet as a pretty linear story. Um, I think it's important to look at what happens in writing if we want to understand how writing actually works within a society. Um, writing outside the expert work of people producing books and documents. And I've become in especially interested in inscriptions, uh, unusual inscriptions made by artisans who might be experts in how you work in stone or wood or metal, but know far less about actual writing, including some uh, artisans who might be completely illiterate their renderings of what is supposed to be writing can sometimes be fascinating, as we all see. Um, so looking at inscriptions in particular, many inscriptions, of course, most inscriptions, especially in ancient times, in Roman times, were produced by experts with their own norms and traditions. But there are also a number of people uh, in a different situation um, who are often handed a text they need to put into stone or metal, but they don't really know how to do the lettering. And the text they're handed in a common cursive everyday script uh, does not give them any clues as to how the letters should actually be drawn on, uh, on stone or another uh, material made to be seen by, by the public. Uh, in, professional, in professional workshops, there are people who specially who specialise in uh, layout and letter design and write all of the text out on stone before an actual letter carver comes in. But sometimes uh, you skip that stage and the artisan needs to work out for himself how writing should look. Um, and so this raises quest questions of material constraints. You know, how, does, how, how do you deal with writing in this or that material? Uh, in what in different media, uh, but it also raises cognitive issues, especially in non-expert uh, workmen who, um, whom we should look at asking ourselves how they perceive letter forms in the first place, especially when they don't know much about writing or are completely illiterate, and how they think they can render them in a more formal style uh, in the final product. So I come from a tradition of paleography which insists very much, which focuses very much on cursivity um, with the general idea that if you have plenty of time and money, you can write slowly and carefully. But as the pressure of business um, gets you to write faster, you become messier and that, that is how cursive writing emerges. Um, it sort of just happens without you really wanting to do it. Um, and so concepts uh, of type design um, and calligraphy have been, in a way, a revelation. They've told me about the necessary decisions, the decision-making in 
the production of especially formal writing. And so this talk is script meets tech, but it, it could also have been paleography meets type design or typography, uh, because there's so much that I think paleographers could learn from type designers in the way they look at writing, which is often much closer. It's, it's looking at writing much closer than, at much closer range than many paleographers do. Um, I must say, I'm, I'm quite surprised there's been so much history already since this morning, so I feel less of an outlier as a paleographer in this, in this gathering. Um, so as I've said, we've, we'll be looking at unusual inscriptions and trying to understand as much as we can um, about the decision-making processes um, in context, so material factors, but also uh, the ways in which this formal lettering relates to more common, cursive, messy, everyday handwriting, which, which is what most people would have been familiar with, especially in Roman times. We imagine the Romans writing and reading uh, stuff like this. Uh, whoops. Yes, like this, um, which is probably the first thing you saw during your studies in type design. Um, this, uh, so as you know, is fonts in use, Trajan, stealing a joke from, uh, <laughs> from Thomas Vieux Marchand, with whom I had the pleasure of actually standing in front of this inscription, and this photograph is from two weeks ago. You can see the door is open. We even went to the top of the column, which not many people can say. Um, and so, yes, there is much uh, beyond this kind of Roman lettering, uh, to the point that much of it is even often difficult to read, and even lettering that's supposed to be formal uh, ends up being more or less illegible, and much of the material I can show today uh, is material that was sent to me by people saying, could you help me read this, this text makes no sense. Um, and in some cases, we're still not quite sure what they mean. Um, so, yes, Trajan, in order to, uh, to quote Fred Gaudi, all the ancient guys, you know, stole all our best ideas. So this sort of uh, absolute ideal of the Roman, the Roman capital letter form. Um, so now on to very different kinds of Roman lettering. First, a, a quick glimpse um, of a pre-classical example. Uh, when we tend to think of pre-classicals, of republican, uh, pre-imperial Roman lettering as something which is interestingly sans serif, but usually uh, more or less rough and irregular, especially compared to Greek lettering, which is much more geometric. Uh, I just wanted to show here, um, in this example, of a large marble basin from the second century uh, BC, um, that in a case like this, it is precisely a, um, prob a constraint coming from the medium that um, leads the uh, artisan to produce such perfect geometry. Because in this case, we have bronze lettering inlaid into marble. And so you need to get the measurements exactly right. Uh, to inlay the metal into the stone. And the best way of doing it, of course, is doing it geometrically. Um, but we'll be looking um, rather more at later stuff uh, and of cases in which uh, letters are not carved as usual in inscriptions. They're not painted as in the famous Pompeii uh, lettering painted on, on the walls of the city, uh, but we're looking at lettering produced with other means. In this case, we have what we almost might call logos uh, in bricks and tiles, uh, in which you see how uh, both the medium and the shape to which the, the lettering has to adapt produces some very un-Latin looking results, not what you would expect of Roman lettering, uh, with really clever sort of actual graphic design uh, and adaptation of letter forms to, to the, the medium and the, the shape. Um, so this happens in many kinds of manufactured objects, like water pipes, all sorts of everyday material, where the, let the lettering is impressed using a stamp. So it's not, not carved, of course, or, or painted. Um, 
Other forms of brush lettering, to, apart from the formal brush lettering I mentioned on the walls of Pompeii, uh, are things like this, which I've never seen in any book on epigraphy or paleography, and which I think is absolutely stunning. Uh, this is the kind of lettering. It, 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 this also, I would say, looks very un-Latin. It looks almost oriental. You can see the main, the main um, feature is brush angle with very thin vertical lines, and all you see practically is gigantic serifs. Uh, I especially love the numbers at the bottom. You see C, C, V, 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 and this upstroke is an I. Uh, I think this also deserves to be seen by by more people than just archaeologists specialising in this kind of material. We've heard about wine labels this morning, and so here you have oil labels. Uh, these are painted on these large oil jars uh, in which oil was imported from Spain to Rome by the thousands. Um, and here again, you wonder what the reason was for this kind of writing. I was wondering if it might be seen you know, a bit like uh, writing on highways, <laughs> made to be seen at an angle. If you're looking, I don't know, from the bottom of, from the top of your ship into the hull, you need to read things from, you know, at a slanting angle in the dark. I don't know. Uh, we need to ask an archaeologist about this. But the uh, the letter form, I think, says something of the fun of the function. Um, so next, so these are actually pieces of expert work. We're not dealing with illiterate artisans at all here. Um, the next cases are quite different. This is the church of um, Santa Maria di Trastevere, where we were also a couple of weeks ago with, with uh, uh, Thomas and, his, uh, and everyone from the uh, Atelier National de Recherche Typographique. In, um, and at the front of the church, you have this extraordinary open-air museum of letter forms. Uh, we'll be focusing on this one inscription here, which is a fourth century Christian inscription, uh, belonging to a time when many more people were going not to professional letter carvers to have their tombstones uh, inscribed, but had them done simply by the fossores, by the grave diggers, who were not always um, great experts in, in uh, classical lettering and produced all sorts of variants of letter forms, often related to more or less current cursive forms of handwriting, but sometimes with quite extraordinary results like this one, which unusually includes some letter forms we might call uh, minuscule as the first M. Uh, this most extraordinary A, uh, and other letters that we'll be going into um, immediately. Uh, you'll notice the C here, so this is supposed to be in proper Latin, it would be Mercurio Filio Innocenti Anorum Quinque Parentes Posuerunt, so the, the, the grammar and phonetics are also completely off. Uh, but you'll notice here the C is actually a Greek sigma, so you have someone who's in between Latin and Greek. Um, but the most... A uh, curious aspect of the whole thing is that it's been read as I've just read it to you, but if you look at the letter forms um, at closer range, you'll see that the R's and the S's are actually the same letter form. So they're not uh, visually distinct. Here you have something that could be poreron or poseson, you don't know. Um, so here's the complete alphabet and the problematic letter forms. Uh, you see the E is what we would call today an uncial E, derived from cursive forms. Um, the L, the, the U or V, uh, just the same. The most cur curious letters are this, this A, uh, this M, and this one. The A, so I think these letters, you can start understanding where they come from uh, if you start comparing this inscription with examples of book or document writing from the same time in more or less cursive or minuscule forms. Um, here is a papyrus, a famous papyrus from the same period. And you can see how many of the letter forms match what we have in the inscription. Um, some don't match completely. The, the, there's no single common script that matches this, ins this inscription, but you find separate letter forms that work. 
the interesting thing in M is how this has been formalized. You can see how formalization is done by adding serifs. Uh, in this case, the serif is not put where we would put it today, but it's the same kind of idea. And especially the A, if you look at that, I think, which is the source of this idea, you see how serifs are coming up in unexpected places. So this, again, is a form of improvisation based on um, a model that might have been written in a script, something like this. And you can see, looking at another document, this marginal note in another manuscript, how R and S in common cursive scripts can become quite similar and explain how you can end up with this here. So in this case, again, the artisan knew more or less how to read and to produce letter forms, but was not good enough at reading the text to decide if it was an S or an R and just left it uh, undecided like this. Um, then we have, I'll move on to a much later, um, much later example, which is this inscription around 1300, uh, which has baffled epigraphers. Um, with very strange, very decorative letter forms, especially the, what you might have guessed here are uh, S's. And so the text reads as hic sunt reliquia, here are the relics of St. John the Baptist. Um, and here again, it's interesting to try and understand where each letter comes from. Uh, I think it comes from a, a mixture of three or four different kinds of writing. Basically, Gothic majuscule and Gothic minuscule, that's easy enough. Uh, but then also very decorative kinds of writing that you also find at the time, but only in very decorative kinds of writing used in charters, in uh, solemn documents, plus this really weird RE uh, whoops, ligature, which you would not do in an inscription, but, makes, uh, but which makes perfect sense compared to documentary writing in which you do get that kind of connection between letters. Uh, this one is re still relatively reasonable compared to the next one, which is one, one of my favorite. Um, this one is in the Swiss Alps. Uh, it's an inscription that was done for a chapel built in uh, 1485. So functionally, this should have been formal lettering. It's what you would expect on a chapel. But in this village in the Alps, this is the best they could do. Um, and this one has baffled uh, paleographers for decades trying to read what it says. Uh, what it actually says is this, 1485. So this is the abbreviated form. We'll come back to the letter forms. And this would be the full text. Ego presbyter Ioannis, uh, Ioannis Mauritius de Ponde. I, the priest, John, uh, well, his name is Giovanni Maurizio, from Ponte, uh, which is the name of the place, feci facere in honore Sancti Spiritus. Had this chapel built uh, in honor of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so going back to the letter forms, you can see... Um, they are quite unusual, uh, of course, and very different from anything you would expect at that date, thinking in terms of Gothic writing. They're monoline, sans serif, or almost. Um, and this, I believe, is a stone cutter who has absolutely no idea of how to read or write, but is trying to make the best of what he can see. Uh, and thinking in those terms, along those lines, I think you can reconstruct what his model actually looked like. Um, thinking in terms of a broad nib you would usually have at that date for writing anything. Uh, the first thing you can see is how he is doing a process of skeletonization. He's, he's, um, he's uh, making thin lines out of the thick and thin lines of the original. Um, then also, he has, uh, you can see in some cases how he's, he's tricked by some letter forms. This open P, for instance, which you find quite often at the time, leads him to give us a completely open P here, uh, another one there. And here, he doesn't even understand it's the same letter. It was probably a bit off like this. 
and he treats it differently. But what he does have is a great sense of geometry. Um, and so out of these letter forms, with their usual Gothic proportions, he's creating perfectly geometric letter forms in some cases, which are, I would say, unusually uh, modern uh, and bring to mind more than anything else um, geometrics and serifs from the early 20th century. If you look at the, uh, this well-known early version of <laughs> Futura, um, I'm especially struck by the G with the, po the pointy bottom and the ear here, uh, and especially more than anything else, well, square N, of course, and R done as a stroke and a dot, no, which is absolutely perfect. This was, as I may uh, remind you, done in Switzerland. Is it, <laughs> is it chance? I don't know. Is there something in Swiss genes? Uh, well, Tichold wasn't Swiss, but anyway. Um, next, uh, the next chapter is even more about uh, illiterate, illiterate workmen. Um, one medium in which you find lots of pretty weird looking lettering is metal. Uh, probably people working in metal uh, weren't asked to do writing as often as people carving stones. And so you can really find them improvising uh, something they've quite obviously never done before. Um, in one case here, we have this very spectacular tabernacle in a, um, a church in the south, in the northeast part of France. Uh, where you can see this metal worker inventing for himself uh, the principle of sten stencil lettering. This is important because the door uh, used in a tabernacle needs to be metal because it's used as a safe to protect the hosts that are inside the tabernacle. But it's also supposed to be like a window where you can peer in and see and contemplate the host. Uh, so it needs to be both strong metal and see-through. Um, here again, this is an inscription that people have been trying to read for 150 years now. It's just three or four words. The part on the right is clear enough. It says Ave Maria, uh, with one serif missing, and problems here trying to decide what the, where the letter is and where the counter is. See? So he ends up with only one serif, but Ave Maria is clear, clear enough. And the part to the left, I think, comes from a misread text that was given to him, probably in cursive writing again. He probably read an, an X as an A, and something that should have been Corpus Christi, hic est, the body of Christ is here, ends up completely garbled. Um, one uh, piece of evidence that leads me to think that the text says something like the body of Christ is here, which is what you would expect on a tabernacle, uh, is looking at another tabernacle from the early 16th century, um, mm. which I spotted recently in a uh, French museum, uh, in which you see here again someone doing stencil writing, but doing it the wrong way round. He's cutting out the counters instead of cutting out the letters, and he's getting into an impossible situation, especially, especially with things like abbreviation marks above the letters here. Oh, you can't see the, you can't see the, the pointer, sorry. Um, but anyway, the little titles, little abbreviation marks above the letters, and he doesn't know how to keep them in place without cutting all round. Here again, it's pretty difficult to read, but you can, you can work out the part on the left says, Hic Jesus, again, Christus is half hidden in the middle. And then uh, there's a jumble of letters and space between letters, which, um, uh, in which you end up not knowing where the letter is and where the gaps are. Uh, so this one's pretty difficult too, uh, but it ends up with a perfectly normal text. Here is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Filius Dei which is another reason to believe that the other one we saw just before also says something like the body of Christ is here. Um, so these are artisans struggling with unusual work in their usual medium and coming up with opposite solutions 
letters and counters, and both with their own with their own problems. Um, so as opposed to these two people improvising as best they can, uh, in other cases we have we can observe professional traditions emerging for lettering in specific media and especially in metal. Uh, another case of writing in metal, which has baffled archaeologists, uh, is a, a collection, there are three known, uh, of copper rings found in different places uh, from the 13th century with this very cryptic looking kind of uh, inscriptions and also looking quite different. But if you look at them closely enough and compare them, you'll find that some letter forms make sense as possible variants of the same thing. And then you recognize, especially up here uh, on, in the first line, this as a Gothic majuscule M. Then aligning uh, the photographs uh, based on what letters look similar, you end up with something like this. And there you can read, with very extraordinary letter forms, a very similar text. You see how uh, in the different rings you have letters that um, correspond more or less to one another. Um, and what you can actually read is Maria Maria in the first place. And then variants of that in which you have Maria and then a sort of echo. Maria, ya, Maria, ya, ya. <laughs> These are actually uh, magic formulas. These are protective rings with the name of Mary around your, around your finger. Um, and that are maybe inspired by similar kinds of magic formulas you find in the uh, Jewish tradition with sort of letters, with words and parts of letters repeated as an echo. So this is quite a fascinating find. And the, um, the letter forms can be explained by, I don't know if you can say degeneration or just adaptation to writing letters that are about two millimeters high with a graver in metal, you know, and doing it quickly because these were probably sort of ma mass produced rings for pilgrims or, um, and they're cheap rings, they're copper, they're not gold. And so some of the letter forms here are quite extraordinary, especially in the, uh, well, the top line and the bottom line, the R in the top line, um, the A in the bottom line, they're all quite extraordinary, but once you've identified them, you recognize quite a, a quite normal uh, Gothic majuscule letter form in its basic traits. Uh, so this, again, I think is people improvising in different workshops and coming to different results uh, in the 13th century. From the 14th and 15th century, you can see a tradition setting in with standards for writing very small lettering. This is something for Thomas again. It's le minuscule uh, in medieval times, in, but materially engraved. And what they come up with is a sort of grid writing where letters are built entirely from horizontal and vertical strokes. Um, here you see inscription on the, on the outside of a ring, but it's often also on the inside, which makes it even more difficult to engrave. So this is one where you see the words, you see the word pour, P-O in the top photograph and U-R in the bottom photograph. Um, and other, I could show many similar cases. This is another one that says joie sans fin. So you see I, O is a square with a point at the top and the bottom. And you find that in many cases. Y is a square with a tail. E is more or less square with an upstroke. Sans, uh, you have two long S's, A, square N, etc. So you can see, again, technically it's very, very similar. And this actually is used by um, goldsmiths in most of Europe. I have rings from Spain that look like that, or this uh, reliquary made in Germany in very square looking um, writing again, uh, exactly built along the same principles. And here, uh, better than anything maybe, um, a collection of the punches it's like a legal deposit of your punch as a goldsmith in Rouen in the early 15th century, where you can see uh, that they're all writing in the same style. 
And you can see how the writing is built along two horizontal guiding lines. And that when those guidelines are not straight, well, the writing isn't straight. No, it just follows the guidelines. Uh, but you can see it's built along those two horizontal lines, and then you add vertical lines and the slight oblique or short cross strokes that you need to make one letter different from another. So here you can read, uh, I don't know, the second one is Belle Barbe, uh, the fourth one is Bataille. Uh, but they're, again, a professional tradition. Uh, that you can find as late as the mid-16th century, and then it sort of gets replaced by more modern-looking uh, lettering when Gothic goes out. Um, on a different scale, uh, a completely different technique here, it's not engraving, it's moulding and casting, is what you find in bells. Early examples like this, 1202 in Bayeux, you can see letters that have been modelled and applied to the shape of the bell before it's molded and cast. You can see uh, how the, uh, the pieces of wax overlap, especially the X in the middle. Uh, this gives some pretty weird results sometimes, uh, especially with bell founders who know about making bells, but not about writing, and haven't realized that when they mold and cast their bell, the writing is going to come up the other way around. And so in this case, you get the inscription the wrong way around. <laughs> Uh, if you flip it, you get the text, which is still pretty weird, which, is, which says, this, may this bell of Christ be called blessed, but the letter forms are really, really strange. And then comes uh, around 1400, uh, these examples of bells with letters that have clearly been produced by, um, by molding single letters and then applying them just like the, uh, well, in a negative positive process uh, that is part of the prehistory of movable type and the invention of printing. This is a very clear example with separate letters. And you can see how uh, these letters that should be different heights are all more or less adapted to the same height. So you get sort of mono height um, lettering. Same, the same still happens in the mid 16th century. Uh, won't go into the detail of that one. Uh, and you see how movable type uh, can even become, in some cases, dynamic layout. Uh, <laughs> this is obviously an, uh, an accident that happened to the bell, maybe when they injected the metal, it moved all the letters. And so the, the letters are all jumping about. But you can see they were single letters applied or even single strokes applied to, to the model. Um, and this, is, this process is still used today. It was used in the 19th century with equipment such as this, a foundry matrix sounds like, sounds like a typeface attributed to the wrong foundry, uh, but it's a matrix used in a bell foundry uh, with a Dido kind of writing in the 19th century and all sorts of uh, complete set of letters, numbers, etc. And that is used to this day, uh, not, it's not wood anymore, now it's more like uh, silicon. Uh, and again, we have artisans who know more about bells than about writing. Um, and so this is another field in which type designers and graphic designers are required to avoid the use of aerial on very costly bells for here, a, an aircraft carrier. Um, there. Thanks and enjoy Paris. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions? I think it's. Uh, how much time is it? Are we are okay for time, right? Yes. Uh, hi. Thanks for the talk. That's very um, amazing. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, yeah. I just wondering, do you have any experience by confused by um, whether I I don't know whether this is just um, material conception due to some commercial needs or really just religious really need or either it's just a mistake? And do you have any experience on on spotting 
uh, about which example? Sorry. Um, oh, I just wondering. Do because they're, any they're very different. Well, uh, I tried to make the case that are di very different situations. In some kind, in some cases, we have people who know what they're doing and do these weird, well, things that appear weird, but they have thought about them and they know what they're doing. Uh, mm -hmm. And other cases with people who don't really know what they're doing, uh, yes. including those who probably are completely illiterate. So I think that there's a range of there's a range of different situations. Uh, and the only, my main point, I suppose, was that looking at the extraordinary, uh, sometimes unruly creativity of medieval and ancient individuals uh, faced with technical and functional problems, I think that's a, a, a source of inspiration for boldness in the work you can do today with the new challenges and opportunities of technical change. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Merci pour vos, votre, vos explications. Je voulais savoir si, pour, dans un autre contexte, pour l'art arménien, par exemple, et pour, les, pour toutes ces, tout ce qu'on voit sur les églises que j'ai eu l'occasion de, 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 de voir récemment, est-ce que le même principe s'applique est ou est-ce qu'il y a des mélanges avec l'Iran Est-ce qu'il y a avec le... Oui. Est-ce qu'on retrouve la même problématique well, Est-ce qu'on sait, est qu sait la résoudre uh, Well, we know uh, that the Armenian situation is quite different because I think there's much less, as far as we know, um, sort of cursive, informal writing. Uh, the Armenian tradition of writing tends to be a lot, lot, a lot of pretty formal book writing, at least as in what is preserved. And I actually currently have a student who's working on... Um, the first centuries of Armenian writing. Uh, so we've been looking at that, and he's been looking at inscriptions in particular, and flying a drone and finding inscriptions on tops of churches and all of that. But I think the situation is quite different. It's all very formal. But there again, you can, you can try and understand how this letter form evolves out of this other one, thinking in terms of cursive processes. You know, this stroke becomes, becomes a curve because uh, because of faster writing, etc. But it's um, th there's not the material is far less than what we have, of course, in the, in the Roman alphabet. And I think the situations um, and, and the degrees of proficiency and professionalism in the people who produce writing is, is quite different. I think that is all we have time for before the next talk. But thank you very thank you. much, Mark. Thanks. That was lovely. Thank you.